Hello and welcome to Bio 132. This is your first video and we're going to be talking about the scientific method. The scientific method is a series of steps that scientists follow to make sure their research is unbiased and truthful. To study science is to try to understand the natural world. I'm sure you know people can use data from scientific experiments to support all sorts of ideas and agendas. Scientists are taught to make sure the research itself is free from influence and corruption. The first thing that scientists do is to formally observe the natural world. Observation must be free from the scientist's own bias. Most people see the world around themselves with a certain amount of subjectivity. Subjective means your personal feelings or beliefs influence what you see. When a scientist observes the world, they try to be objective. This means that they try to remove their own personal feelings and judgments from their observation and base the observation on something that can be tested and proved. Take the following statements. My dog is lazy versus my dog sleeps 20 hours per day. Which one is subjective and which one is objective? The subjective statement is, my dog is lazy. This statement is influenced by my feeling that he shouldn't be sleeping quite so much. Versus, my dog sleeps 20 hours per day is an objective statement. This is based on me observing him sleeping about 20 hours per day. This is a provable observation. What about these two statements? I like my students versus my students work very hard. Which one is objective and which one is subjective? I like my students is the subjective statement. This is based on my personal feelings and it's very difficult to test or measure my feelings. My students work very hard is an objective statement. I can measure how many hours of homework my students do in Bio 132. As a teacher, I have noticed that students avoid reading the textbook and have trouble understanding it when they do read it. This observation led me to the second step of the scientific method, making a hypothesis. A hypothesis uses inductive reasoning to find a possible explanation or solution to the observation. Inductive reasoning is the gathering of lots of bits of information into a cohesive idea. I was always taught that a hypothesis is what you would call an educated guess, taking what you observe of the world and have learned of the world around you and trying to form a statement of what it means. Hypotheses can often be phrased with an if-then statement. Many scientific studies are done this way. If I stop eating french fries for lunch, then I will lose weight. If I go to bed earlier, then I won't be as tired tomorrow. If I don't feed the dog at the table, then he will learn not to beg. In the example of this class, my hypothesis was, if I record video lectures, then my students will understand the material better. This statement allows me to predict the outcome of my hypothesis. My students will do better. However, the most important thing for a hypothesis is that it must be testable. This is why scientists have to be objective. Testing your feelings or assumptions is almost impossible. So a better hypothesis for the class might be, if I record video lectures, then my students' grades will improve. That is something I can test. Now that I have my hypothesis, I can do experiments to test it. The hypothesis might be supported or rejected. To design an experiment, you have to compare different groups. Ideally, you will be able to control everything about your test subjects except one thing, whether they watch the lecture videos or not. This is called the experimental variable, the thing that is different between your control group, who doesn't get the videos, and the experimental group that gets to watch the videos. In reality, a study like this would be very difficult because each student is unique and there are many other factors that affect students' grades. 
Scientists often try to minimize these other factors by using an animal model. Common animal models used are mice, fruit flies, worms, and plants. These models allow us control over the subject's environment and genetic makeup. That way we know the experimental variable really is the only difference between groups. Once you have set up and run your experiment, scientists must collect, analyze, and present the data. Oftentimes, you will see data presented in graphs or tables. A graph like this shows a comparison between two quantities. In this example, scientists studied the variation in cholesterol levels of subjects over several weeks. The experimental variable is usually plotted on the x-axis, as we see time is plotted here. The dependent variable is usually plotted on the y-axis. In this case, the cholesterol level is dependent on the time. The points represent the average values, and the bars above and below each point are called error bars and represent how much variability the scientists saw in their data. Ideally, you want very small error bars. By looking at the graphs and reading the labels, we can easily see that the cholesterol levels were highest during week two. The most important thing about data is that it must be repeatable. This means that you must be able to show that the same thing happens each time you run your experiment. It wasn't just a one-time thing. In addition, other scientists must be able to reproduce and verify your results. Once the experiment is finished and the data is gathered, scientists now need to go back to their hypothesis. Scientists are very shy about using the word prove. Instead, they ask, did the data support the hypothesis or did it reject the hypothesis? If the hypothesis is rejected, scientists need to figure out why their hypothesis may have been incorrect. This type of work can be very frustrating and take years to sort out a true understanding. However, if the hypothesis was supported, that piece of information is added to the knowledge we have about the observation. After many years and many different experiments, if all data from all sources supports a similar explanation, that explanation will become accepted as a theory. A theory is an accepted explanation for how the world works. The preponderance of evidence that has been completed will support the theory. Common theories are the cell theory, which states that all organisms are made up of cells, the gene theory, which states that information stored in our genes contributes to our form and function, and the theory of evolution, which states that species change over time. The theory of evolution has been around for over a hundred years and has been supported by so many different types of evidence that some people like to call it the principle of evolution. Let's watch how the scientific method works in a medical trial. Scientists think that a new antibiotic will work better at curing ulcers than the current treatment. The hypothesis is that antibiotic B is a better treatment than antibiotic A. You can state this hypothesis in an if-then manner. If I give antibiotic B, then patients will have a higher cure rate. Scientists will split the test subjects into three groups. Since we are comparing two antibiotics, we want to make sure not only that antibiotic B is better than antibiotic A, we also want to make sure that the antibiotics are better than nothing at all. Therefore, we give one group a placebo. This is a pill that has no drugs in it. That way we can make sure that there is no psychological effect from the patients thinking they are not being treated. The success of the treatment is determined by endoscopy or looking at the ulcers with a camera on a scope. To keep it objective, scientists use a double-blind study, which means that neither the patients taking the pills nor the doctors determining the success or failure knows which group each person is in. This makes sure the results are objective. The data is collected, and as we saw before, the experimental variable, or which drug was received, is on the x-axis. The placebo-only group is called the negative control. We do not expect to see much of a difference here. The data indicate that antibiotic B has a better cure rate than antibiotic A. 
80% of people were cured in the antibiotic B group versus only 60% of people in the antibiotic A group. The authors of this study concluded that the hypothesis was supported. That's it for the scientific method. See you in class.